What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Datadash and today is April 3rd of 2024. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, I'm finally here to share with you guys today my top altcoin narratives going in to 2024. The ones in which I believe could win out big in the event of an upcoming altcoin cycle in the next coming weeks or the next month or two. Now this is the first potential altcoin cycle we could see in nearly three years and it's a big deal, meaning we need to prepare prepare for it, not only in trying to time our positions right, but making sure we're actually positioned in the best performing plays with the most captivating narratives in order to heavily outpace Bitcoin and capture upon the opportunity. However, above all, guys, I know that a lot of people out there will just want to take a look at the names of the narratives that I'm watching for and the projects, and you'll be able to find those down below in the comments if you really want to do that. But I believe this is an imperative video for you guys to watch because I'm not only going to be talking about the narratives and projects that I'm interested in, in. I'm also going to be talking about why I'm interested in them. I'm going to be talking about the multiple expansion potential these projects have. And along with that as well, the important nuances and details around these narratives and how to actually position yourself rightfully at any given time in these narratives. You don't want to pigeonhole yourself into one project nor one narrative. And outside of that as well, it's imperative to understand the risks associated with all these different narratives and how we can try to make sure we hedge our bets and have a good risk reward profile to win out big. You do not get all coin cycles very often. So if you've got a cup of coffee, if you've got some time on your hands, sit down, join me here, give me some time to ramble if you can put up with me, and let's go ahead and talk a little bit about it. Now, before we dive into the narratives, guys, I don't wanna leave you guys hanging for too long. I wanna go ahead and just talk about a few key things here. The first thing I wanna emphasize, as many of you know here, we've been probably out of anyone on YouTube a bit more skeptical here of market price action in the long run. Uh, again, we started to kind of change our tune back in October 2023. And since we've made some great bets in the market, talking about some of the coins we'll be discussing today, as well as some new fresh names that we haven't discussed. Uh, but the main thing I want to talk about here is that above all, an altcoin cycle is not guaranteed. I'm going to say that right out the bat. I know a lot of people tell you it is guaranteed. It's a slam dunk. Go ahead and start accumulating positions and preparing for greener pastures and things to go parabolic. Right now, we are building an important technical formation right here in Bitcoin's price. And so far, things are looking pretty good. We are having some breaks in the 21 day, but we are far extended away from our long-term moving averages and bulls seem to be continuing to push up prices. So as we are sitting around all-time highs, this is pretty good. But the key thing we're gonna be watching for here is a continued uptrend in Bitcoin. A continued uptrend in Bitcoin is not only going to allow some of the altcoin related, uh, related narratives that we're going to be talking about later on to do well, but outside of that as well for a broader altcoin upswing. If ETF inflows start to weaken, if Bitcoin cannot continue appreciating in price, that is going to be a significant warning sign. But beyond all, the big thing we are watching for is others' dominance. I'm not here today to talk about buying Ethereum. I'm not here to talk about buying Solana. I'm here to talk about plays that can make multiples upon multiples, not just in their USD terms, but also against Bitcoin. And as many of you know, if you've been through an altcoin cycle or two, we've been through many of that in the past it is clear that it is easy to make these kind of returns, even in these more elevated markets, because we're talking about markets and topics that are small mid cap areas of the crypto space, where most of the plays are a couple million, a couple hundred million, maybe a billion in market capitalization to right under around five to 10 billion maximum. So these are the kind of plays that can easily three, five X as Bitcoin is going on from its already $1.25 trillion bill, or one. $1.25 trillion market cap on towards maybe $2.5 trillion if it were to double from this point on, right? So again, we're not going to focus so much on the numbers. We're not going to be diving so much into the charts today. Let's go ahead and dive into our narratives here. I want to first talk a little bit here about the 3 to 10x narrative category. There are two key narratives that I think you need to keep on your radar here that could give you these kind of safe bet returns, right? If you're looking to kind of allocate the majority of your capital on something that you can have a pretty surefire bet is going to easily outpace Bitcoin in a further uptrend, and along with that as well, potentially give you a nice reward profile where you could 3x your Bitcoin profile, maybe in a more optimistic scenario, give you a 5, 10x and returns. Well, in this case, here are two narratives that I think are going to carry the way forward. The first one is probably one you guys have heard me talk a bit about here, and that is Bitcoin infrastructure. Now, essentially speaking, I don't think I have to explain too much why Bitcoin infrastructure is significant here with the Bitcoin ETF inflows, Bitcoin being the dominant asset and still being 
the most untapped source of liquidity in the crypto space by the mass of market cap, liquidity, and trade volume and activity on the Bitcoin network. Still on the Bitcoin network, outside of ordinals as a technology, you really can only do Bob to Alice type sending and receiving transactions. And that's not very exciting. That just essentially allows you to hodl Bitcoin or to take it onto exchanges and trade and speculate. What we want is a protocol that's going to allow us to be able to do more complex transaction types. Think of what you're able to do on the Ethereum network or Solana, where you can swap, in this case, Bitcoin with various different types of tokens, or being able to lock up Bitcoin as collateral in order to take out loans or be able to mint stable coins and do more complex DeFi type transactions, as well as different types of DeFi apps we have yet to see yet that may even tap more into the real world or tie Bitcoin to real world assets. You name it. All the different kind of cross narratives that usually play a role into DeFi as a whole come into the topic of Bitcoin related infrastructure in a big way. When we consider the valuation of Bitcoin at $1.25 trillion at the time of recording, tapping into that unaddressed liquidity is going to be a huge market opportunity. And while Stacks in this case is the largest L2, which scares some people away from seeing that an opportunity to make a return on it, in many cases, and we saw this very clearly with Solana and Avalanche in the last cycle, protocols that in many ways, and probably back then in my view, seemed overvalued, continue to expand and expand and expand because they were the leading horse in the race. They had the best value proposition when it came to their narratives as alternative L1s. In this case, Stacks is the premier L2 with a bubbling ecosystem of different applications from decentralized exchanges to NFT protocols, as well as a whole range of different key infrastructure that people would want to see and utilize around Bitcoin. Now, outside of this as well, there are two big things that I want to talk about. There is obviously SIP-021, the Nakamoto release recently. This is going to probably be the biggest network upgrade we've seen for stacks yet. It means, in this case, quicker block times or settlement on transactions. It's also going to mean much more heightened security around being able to have Bitcoin on the Stacks network in a non-custodial way. And I think that this is probably the biggest dynamic here because from a fundamentals basis here, and I've pointed this out on the channel before, at the end of the day, really, Stacks is a momentum trade like all cryptocurrencies in my view. And that's all altcoins, really. But at the end of the day, if you want to make a more fundamentally strong case for Stacks, you're going to need a lot more TVL. And having this more secure framework to actually deposit Bitcoin in the Stacks network with less custodial risk, I think is something that is going to bring a lot more liquidity and a lot more innovation and users into the ecosystem, a lot more comfort from Bitcoin participants. So this is a huge governance proposal that passed with Falan Colors, and people are obviously very excited about it. Now, I want to go ahead, though, and talk a little bit about from a valuation perspective. Again, whether you're looking at the circulating market cap or the fully diluted, you're talking about $4.8 billion, $6 billion. Sounds like a pretty large figure. Sounds like it might be a bit difficult to really multiply from here on out. But when you consider the valuation of networks like Solana and how much Solana has carried forward here throughout this move or this cycle so far, and on very little traction, you can see how easy it is to be able to get, in this case, STX from the current market cap, let's just kind of give or take, say about five, billion dollars to get that to 10 billion dollars to 15 to 20 to 25 to 30 billion dollars to get massive multiples from where we are here today especially in a broader move of an altcoin cycle with lots of potential upside i think that this is one of those narratives that while stacks has made a great move so far and we started talking about stacks at around 60 cents i think that there's a potential for this thing to continue carrying forward from here on out i think that this is just the beginning here when it comes to the broader narrative of bitcoin and infrastructure. We have yet to see a lot of massive liquidity move over. And if Bitcoin grows bigger and bigger with the ETF inflows continuing to be strong, the having it playing in and allowing for Bitcoin's price to just get bigger and bigger, people's risk sentiment and appetite is going to get a bit bigger as well. And that's going to allow for it to trickle down into a whole range of other Bitcoin related narratives. All right, so we talked about that, and I wanted to give also an honorable mention to Zeta Chain. I have to be honest, if I were to pick one of the two here, guys, I like Stacks. Zeta Chain is a relatively new launch here in 2024, uh, a Bitcoin infrastructure play. I've kept my radar since it launched. It had a near direct listing on Coinbase uh, from the time it had been created. And it is essentially focused on creating side chains. One of the big features they have is Bitcoin related side chains. 
But at the end of the day, guys, while I definitely think that Zeta Chain is one you should keep on your radar, I think that Stacks is going to be the, the leading horse here. Uh, even though from a market cap perspective, uh, Stacks is probably a little bit more uh, highly valued on a, a um, circulating supply market cap, Zeta Chain came out way too high on a fully diluted market cap, and you can see it in the price action uh, that essentially is just not keeping up with Stacks. You can always do custom ratios. Uh, so this is a little tip I'm going to give you guys here uh, for this video or essentially you can do custom ratios for different plays. So in this case, if I wanna see which one's winning right here, I can do STX BTC, I'll use the Binance peers, it gives us some of the best price action, and I'm gonna divide in this case Zeta. And actually what I'll do here is utilize the USD pair because we don't have it for, um, we don't have a BTC pair for Zeta. So we can use the Coinbase pairs here. And right here we can see that Stack so far has been wildly outpacing in this case, Zeta. So essentially, we're gonna be sticking with the ones that are winning in this race. We want plays that are leading the way forward here. It's nothing personal. It's not about which one has the strongest fundamentals at the end of the day. That definitely probably is a reason why Stacks is leading, but price action showcases it here. So we don't need to argue about it. Stacks is the leader right now in Bitcoin infrastructure. All right, so I rambled on about about that. Let's go ahead and talk about the next three to 10X narrative here, and that's DPIN or AI infrastructure. Now DPIN as a term reaches a whole range of different decentralized physical infrastructure network use cases. This could be for storage, it could be for all types of different narratives out there, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, internet, bandwidth, essentially, there's all types of different resources that people can essentially share in a distributed fashion from their mobile phone, from their computer, and provide these resources to people who need them and earn while doing so. But the big one that I'm focused on here, I really like to put aside a lot of the narratives around all those different resources and focus in on AI-related plays, or essentially distributed networks that are related towards giving up uh, graphics processing units, graphical resources to not only do rendering for various different types of distributed jobs, but most importantly for AI related jobs that are highly dependent on GPU resources in order to be able to process a variety of different text prompts, AI art generation, and a whole range of other AI related services. So as this is just getting bigger and bigger here, there's this big shift for companies moving to AI, and there's a growing amount of use cases or even niche case cases for generative AI. There's a big demand and a big gap between supply and demand for GPU resources. And the projects out there that are going to allow for people to utilize their untapped resources in their PC, like I got right here, I got a nice graphics processing unit. When I'm not using it to game or make videos, I'm essentially able to use it to earn passively. Now we've got two projects here I'm gonna be talking about here. Now there are tons of different projects out there. I'll make some small honorable mentions in a bit, but I want to, again, really help you guys focus in on the plays that are, again, going to give you these types of consistent predictable returns, good risk adjusted profiles here. Now, you've heard me probably talk a lot about Render. I think Render is a really great project at the end of the day. Uh, we can see here Render is, again, kind of the, the leading horse in the longer run here. It's been around for a long period of time since back in 20, uh, 2020. And we can see as the, as the long haul here goes, this has been a really like a nice uptrend long term. So it's a sustainable project in that sense compared to a lot of crypto. But beyond that as well, really just over the last year, uh, this thing has made a monster move. We started talking about Render about around two, three bucks uh, on a much more active basis back in kind of October, November. But since then, again, it's just been continued to turn higher here. And like a lot of projects, it's going through a nice cool down here from around 13 bucks down here towards nine bucks. Uh, essentially speaking, this is sitting at again a you know give or take on the circulating or fully diluted four or five billion dollar market cap. Again, I think this easily can do another three x here. Again, if Bitcoin is continue to charge higher, the AI narrative stays strong, risk on assets continue to kind of balloon and bubble up here in the near term. So long as the the momentum around Nvidia as a stock right, is the leading GPU manufacturer of the world, signals that people are still bullish on the AI narrative and are continuing to pay a higher price premium, then you can bet here in this case on render. Again though, just keep in mind that it is very imperative that that trend continues uh, in the GPU related stocks. If you start seeing, in this case, NVIDIA, SMCI, I'm, I'm stepping a bit into equities as I talk about this, uh, but you can look up NVDA, uh, SMCI on TradingView. If you start seeing these not holding up above their moving averages and there's some pretty harsh sell side days and they're not showing signs of an uptrend, I would kind of steer clear of this narrative here. So just keep that in mind. 
Uh, but I want to go ahead and talk more importantly, though, about the altcoin narrative here around, uh, you know, essentially this deep end narrative. Because if I'm positioning myself in this play, I want to let you guys know that I've got a play that I think is going to do much better than Render, and that is Golem. Now, Golem is also a legacy play in the crypto space. It's actually been around longer than Render Network, launched back in 2017. And while Golem, like a lot of projects, has kind of not put so much pivoted, but essentially kind of realigned their focus, they've been able to be what they've been from the get-go, which is this kind of distributed network of computational resources. But in this case, they've really been honing in on doing essentially what Render's doing, allowing you to use your untapped GPU resources. And without spending so much time to go into the nuanced details, trying again to argue about fundamentally which one is better or worse, I could waste your day doing that. What I'm gonna talk about, which matters most of all, is which one's going to outperform. And generally speaking, when I take a look here at Golem, which is not one-tenth of the size of render. It is in market cap terms, but from a fundamental adoption perspective, it's not. So essentially, we've got in this case, we've got render, and I'll load that as well. We've also got Golem, which is sitting at a $500 million market cap, fully diluted, whole supply is circulating now. So no, no VC unlocks, uh, no you know kind of long-term holdings from whales, participants, that's just been waiting for this opportunity to unload the market. It's all out there. Right, so we've got this opportunity here where these stocks could really, uh, as you see, these cryptos could really start to take off here. And I think that you've got a much bigger multiplier expansion here. You've got a beautiful chart here where essentially this has been the key level of resistance throughout history. I think this is the time to shine here where the narrative is really there, and this could really just start to rapidly expand higher here. I, again, not going to be doing any kind of extensive TA here, but you get my point here where essentially you have the longer the base, the bigger the breakout. This is a famous term from Kathy Wood uh, when it came to Tesla. It was true. Tesla had a massive breakout back in 2020, 2021. And this is a very true kind of phenomenon here where essentially you have these long-term projects. They, they've been fundamentally building, sustaining themselves. You know, they might have had some decent establishment already with their, their kind of business model. And I think Golem was one of those projects. Uh, Render as well has started to see this kind of longer base, bigger breakout move. In this case, Golem, I think, has got a very clear technical setup here. And once it really clears through that prior resistance range, which I think is sitting somewhere, you know, basically around a dollar, once we get above there, I think this thing is really going to pick up. So I've already got a position in Golem just to give you guys a bit of transparency. If you guys want to be able to track my positions, uh, you know, where I'm positioned in the market uh, on some of these narratives, when I'm getting in, when I'm getting out, you guys can always check out the dashboard down below in the description. Shameless plug, but I just want to let you guys know about that. It's a great resource. If you love the free content we put out here on the channel, you guys can get access to it. Uh, you can get 20% off if you sign up on an annualized basis. You'll get access to the Dash Report discussion group where there's sometimes even more alpha than what I share in the Dash Report or what you guys would get here. We have our mid-month webinars where you guys can ask me questions. And of course, the 20-page report that covers crypto, stocks, forex, commodities, the whole shebang every single month. So just letting you guys know about that if you want to check that out. But Golem is one of those positions that we built recently, and we're probably going to be adding more to as time progresses. So let's go ahead and continue. I wanted to give a few honorable mentions, even though these were the ones we talked about. I know some people have asked me about Akash Network. Akash is also cool. I, I have nothing you know fundamentally against Akash. One thing I really love, Akash actually not only has one of the cleanest uh, onboarding experiences uh, you know, around, uh, you know, distributed GPU resources, but they also have uh, public stats around the Akash network, which I really think this should be like a standard render and Golem and a whole other projects for the various narratives should have stuff like this. So you can really see the real transparent data and, and not just be betting on price action, interpreting things. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the big thing I want to say here, Akash does have one issue, and that is that it's got a huge circulating market cap versus what it had in the past. Uh, you know, versus you know, where prices are generally speaking where they were back here in 2021. You can see that there's more than three times uh, the circulating token supply by market cap than there was before. So that's where I'm a little bit weary on this one. I wouldn't be betting all my eggs on Akash Network. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this one has gone through a nice pullback here. It's cooled down a little bit. Uh, you know, maybe you know, consider watching this at some lower price levels. We'll see. Uh, but I, I want to make sure that it maintains trend strength. 
There's also Kudos as well and Flux. These are ones that are, are not so centrally around the AI narrative. Uh, they do have uh, some degree of exposure towards those narratives. They've again also cooled off as well. So maybe a time to potentially just maybe look at those as well if they look good. But again, at the end of the day, guys, don't overcomplicate things. I'm just giving you guys some, some breadcrumbs here for some things to look into, uh, to not pigeonhole you into the one play I'm exposed to. I'm not here to show you my bag. The reason I'm positioned in Golem here, and the reason why I'm trying to kind of keep our focus on a few key plays here, is because we don't want to lose sight of the kind of solid risk reward bets that are gonna make sure we at least come out winning on this cycle. I'm not saying anything's absolutely guaranteed, but just keep that in mind here that you don't want to trip up. You don't want to you know, kind of overexpose yourself to too many plays and really minimize your returns. You wanna be in the plays that are, are looking like they're gonna win pretty big. So the next narrative here that I wanna talk about, we'll bring it over here to our list, is uh, the essential five to 15X narrative that I think could really outpace Bitcoin, and that is meme coins with an additional caveat as well meme chains. Now, let's take a step back with me here for a moment. I know meme coins are not the most exciting topic. I know in many ways, it almost feels a little bit dirty sometimes to talk about meme coins, because many people, including myself, are, are wondering, we're, I'm seven years into crypto, I started covering crypto back in 2017, and meme coins are some of the best performing assets we have. Well, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we are traders, we are trying to maximize returns. And because of that, we need to focus in on the narratives that are winning out. We cannot fight the market or the trend. If you don't wanna trade or invest in them, you don't have to. If you don't feel comfortable trading in them, that's fine. But I'm here today to actually talk about a few select meme coins that I think have the criteria to remove a lot of the risk factors that come with meme coins. I'm talking about rug pulls, I'm talking about early VC or whale founded uh, you know, meme coins that essentially just pop up overnight, they pump up 300% and then they dump into oblivion and wreck everyone who actually put their capital and trust into the project. I want to talk about a few plays here that actually meet criteria that can help you to stay safer in the meme coin world, but also have the massive multiplier expansion to become potentially staple meme coins for Solana or the Ethereum blockchain. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Well, first, I want to talk about Cheems here. So Cheems as a product here is a very small cap play here, right? I'm looking for these kind of small cap plays. I, I really, at the end of the day, I don't like to sugarcoat it, guys. Like, I like to find plays that have that 5100X multiple because I'm not gonna be putting all my money into Cheems, right? So I've got a small position in Cheems, right? It's a fraction of my portfolio, like single digit amounts. But the big thing here is that I think Cheems is one of those plays that could rise up towards being like Bonk. It could be like Dog With Hat, all these other Solana meme coins we've seen. And the reason I think that's the case is because Cheems, alongside the other meme coins we're gonna be talking about today, meet a essential criteria here, which is that they were not created in less than three months, okay? These projects have been around for years in many cases or at, at a minimum, multiple months to a year, okay? Now I'll talk about why this is very imperative here. The reason it's imperative is because the time history showcases here that essentially there have been no rug pulls here. Anyone who wanted to get out of their positions are out by now. These are essentially much more fair launch meme coins that have longer term intentions. And essentially speaking, we can see as price action has played out here since back in October, James has been making some solid moves. It really came out of the rough here. Someone, was, uh, these players out here were accumulating big positions and setting a much higher low here on prior resistance from back here in January, 2023. So I love the technical setup here. I love the ability to be able to get back up to the prior all-time highs and you've already got from that point on multiples from where we are now, but an ability for it to get back up to those highs and again, charge higher. There are no price levels I can give you here directly, guys. I'm talking about this going into uncharted territory we haven't seen yet, and it would be silly for me to try to do TA on these things. I'm not a Nostradamus. The main thing I want to emphasize here is that with something like Cheems, it's got great meme capacity. Cheems is like, essentially, you know, if you think about Bonk in this case, Cheems is related to the Bonk meme at the end of the day. It's a legacy meme alongside Doge and Pepe, 
All right, you see it on crypto Twitter a lot. So Teams has been around, it, it, it speaks volume of the fact that it's been around since back in 2011. So we've got long price history here. It's a legacy meme coin here. And I think generally speaking, it's just been waiting for its moment here. We're starting to see the initial wind up phase here. And that's when you can really start to see this thing explode higher here. So Teams is again, one of those micro cap, small cap plays in the meme coin space that I think has got some really sizable potential. I've already got a position in it for transparency's sake, but I think it's one in which I wanna continue adding to. And I think that it could really make multiples from this point on. And again, being on Solana, it's easily accessible to people. You're not dealing with network fees, et cetera. But the next two that I wanted to talk about here are Pooh and a lot of that as well, Bob. So Pooh and Bob also meet some really important criteria here, which is that essentially they have much more secure smart contracts than most meme coins. Now on the Ethereum blockchain, right? First off, I wanna make it clear, you can also see price history here, right? We can see that Pooh has been around since May of 2023. So coming up on a year here since Pooh has been around. And we've had this really nice build back up here uh, towards the prior uh, relative highs of the past. Uh, we didn't get exactly there. If you if you look at the you know, candle chart, for example, right? It was a little bit higher there. We can see this is building up for a potential, you know, kind of breakout from this point. I, I want to see again, those kind of rallies where we're entering into uncharted territory. There's no historic resistance from that point. The thing can just really start to run up. The mania can build up and price action can really go up and to the right. All right. So Pooh essentially $17 million market cap cryptocurrency here. You know, if we take a look at its market pairings on Uniswap, we can see very clearly 1.6 million liquidity. So plenty of liquidity here per market cap. Good amount of holders here building up over time. But the big thing I want to emphasize here that you guys can always analyze around these projects is that when you take a look at their DEX pairs, you should look at the security, uh, security scan by GoPlus. And essentially, we can see that there are no risks. There's no honeypot risk. There's no uh, whale trading function, all these different things. Uh, you know, In this case, there's also no tax on the trade as well. So when you're buying and selling, you can freely trade Poo in this case without having to incur any tax. I like this kind of setup here. This allows for Poo to be able to really make major multiples, and it removes a lot of the risk here associated with potential whales, uh, you know, unloading or having these kind of rug pull events, right? If we take a look at it from a logarithmic scale, excuse me, I'll just keep it on the regular here. Unfortunately, the, the DEX charts doesn't work like that. Uh, the, the logarithmic scale doesn't work very well, right? We can see here that overall, we've had this nice build up here, building a nice foundation. Buyers seem to be accumulating around this range. Uh, the price structure is a little broken here, nothing too incredibly exciting yet, but I think we're gonna start to see some formation over the next week or so. Just keep an eye on this one. I think this one has got some steam. And last but not least as well is obviously Bob. Bob has been around similar time to Pooh, launched nearly back a year ago when meme coins kind of resurged as a trend when we had some of the initial moves in altcoins. And generally speaking, on a log scale, we can see this one has not returned back to its prior highs so confidently. We're st we've been facing kind of resistance around this range here. But I think overall, it's still the fact that Bob has been able to maintain higher lows here and still shows this kind of stubbornness to hold up here is definitely something that's noteworthy here. Now, Bob, along with that as well, having a slightly bigger market cap than Pooh, still also has a really great degree of liquidity as well. So that's another thing that I like to see. But above all, again, I'm not here to tell you guys any of these are fundamentally stronger than one another. As you notice, I didn't dive into their websites or anything. I think that overall, they've got good meme capability, like Bob, that's easy for people to remember and type. Uh, you've got Pooh as well, a beloved children's cartoon that many of us uh, remember reading or watching when we were kids, and Jeems as well. All three of these have meme energy to them. They have low market caps that have that ability to make the kind of run up that we talked about in the narratives uh, tracker that we just discussed. Outside of this, well, they've also got the price history that makes me confident that they're not overnight rug pulls, that I can actually put sizable money into them that I want to bet and speculate on the market. Uh, now, the last thing I want to talk about here is Doge Chain. Now, I'm not here to per se say that I would long Doge Chain. I don't know enough about the project itself, but the one thing I wanted to say here is that I think you're going to see in this potential altcoin cycle that we're, we're kind of hoping for here in the market, a potential event where we see a meme chain really come to the forefront. I'm talking about a meme coin in the same sense that Bonk, I mean, really, it's, it's so simple to do this, right? And I'm, again, for me, it, it feels a bit gross. I'm not like saying it's gonna be really fundamentally exciting. Like we, I, I, I keep my doubts and I keep my skepticisms, but I wanna say from a price action perspective, I think whether it's Doge Chain or something else, you are gonna see some type of meme coin or dog, cat meme coin related 
uh, L1 or L2 launch, maybe an L2 for like the Ethereum network uh, or for Solana, et cetera, where they utilize the uh, kind of virality of memes to brand an L1 or an L2 infrastructure play. Uh, I don't know what that's going to be. I think Dogecoin is, is, is Doge Chain is essentially a good example of this. They had a meme coin launch in there that did pretty big. Uh, but again, keep an eye out there for not just meme coins, but also this idea that meme coins can become more than just these kind of you know kind of trading vehicles. That they might actually start to tap in a narrative similar in the, in the way that Bonk, for example, uh, has its own decks, etc. All right, now guys, we are stepping in to the next set of narratives here. We're gonna run through these a little bit quicker, but as you can see here on the left-hand side, we are talking about narratives that have, I think in this case, a pretty solid high multiple potential, right? Now, the big thing I wanna emphasize about these narratives here, and as we're kind of going down the list here, guys, uh, the big thing above all is that these are not only just estimations about multiples, they could do far better than what I'm estimating here. They could also underperform. Uh, the main thing I want to emphasize, though, is that not all these narratives will likely succeed. And it is important, and I, I tried my best to kind of, kind of go down the list here and talk about these kind of higher risk, higher reward bets. Uh, many people maybe aren't talking about as much as the narratives we discussed above. These are more the emerging narratives, okay? So just keep that in mind here again. Don't pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself into one of these projects. Have a nice diverse rate of exposure here if you're really gonna be setting in a, a sizable bet or position on a, an altcoin cycle, okay? Just wanted to toss that out there. All right, narrative number four. We are talking about secure L1s, next generation infrastructure for smart contracts or decentralized applications. Now, I know we talked a lot about Bitcoin infrastructure earlier, and I do think the Bitcoin infrastructure is gonna be a big topic. But as we have seen with Solana, uh, we have seen it with uh, Sui and Sei, uh, we've seen it with ICP, we have seen it with a bunch of other projects. Alternative L1 infrastructure competing against Ethereum, I think will always be the never ending narrative in crypto. But it is a never ending race here to figure out which projects will be able to build that better experience. And there are definitely others out there who I think have started to eat away at that Solana being one of them. But outside of that, I think that we are going to see other networks that offer features beyond not only Ethereum, but also Solana and other existing L1s. Kind of a next generation of layer one protocols that are really have yet to have their time and really have their run up. So I want to go ahead and talk about some of these here. Predominantly plays in this case that really have a framework for security as well as privacy. I wanted to talk about Radix here. Now you guys know in this case, Radix is a project we talked about before. I'm going to be very clear and transparent with you guys here as always on this channel, as we mentioned earlier on the place that we have positions in. In the case of Radix in this case, right, we've had Radix as a partner here on the channel for a long time. So I just want to emphasize that. I think that's an imperative thing to share with you guys here. Uh, but outside of this, well, Radix is a really interesting project. Like, this isn't a sponsor mention at the end of the day, right? We're not actively working with Radix at the moment. The key thing I wanted to state here is that I think Radix has something that is really exciting. They have basically spent the last couple of years, I've followed Radix since back in 2018, so they're not some overnight you know, pipe dream. They're actually a real team that has real intentions, and they have this idea of building an entirely new framework, an entirely new language framework that's asset-oriented by nature, and essentially allows you to build smart contracts that are much more secure and remove all of the major vulnerabilities from solidity-based smart contracts that you find in EVM ecosystems. So think about all those L2s, Polygon, Binance Smart Chain, um, Arbitrum Optimism, I mean, I could go down the list here. There's so many out there. Essentially, they're all susceptible to the core problems that I think have really held back Ethereum from adoption. It's not just network fees. It's not just scalability. It is the constant exploits that when you are vulnerable to a smart contract exploit, you get essentially drained of your funds and there are no repercussions and you don't get your funds back. You are leaving crypto forever. This is the biggest adoption barrier in crypto by and large. So essentially fixing security is a big element here. And there's a lot of great resources on Radix's website. Uh, they have a really great page here talking about the full stack of Radix. And it's not just the programming language making smart contracts safer. Uh, it is essentially building a much better user experience beyond the one in which we utilize in EVM environments with MetaMask and legacy crypto wallets that have really not changed since their inception. 
if we're thinking about them fundamentally. So I think you guys should dive into the Radix uh, full stack. This is really a, a great primer talking about the Radix wallet, Scripto, the native programming language of the Radix engine, Cerberus, the consensus mechanism for highly scalable transactions. You know, having things like transaction manifestation where you can actually understand what transactions you're signing, et cetera, uh, smart accounts. So you don't need to have a 12, 24 word seed phrase or you lose all your funds. Being able to actually use your mobile phone to recover like you would with other applications that's highly secure, right? So again, all these kind of things uh, that I think are really imperative to long-term adoption. Uh, there's also Al of Zero as well. Al of Zero is more focused on being a privacy-focused blockchain with smart contract capabilities. We haven't talked as much about Al of Zero on this channel. We've given some hints about it here. Uh, this has been one of the L1s I've been keeping on my radar. Uh, and what I really like, again, as we take a look from kind of like a price action perspective on these plays, uh, again, last year or so, Sideways accumulation here, right? The narrative has been kind of dead in the water here, right? So this is something that I think it hasn't had its moment yet. That's actually good news. These are, are definitely not overbought by a long shot. They're at healthy valuations. I would say diamonds in the rough, relatively undervalued comparative to where they, they should be right now, in my opinion, from a fundamentals perspective. I think the market is going to reprice and recorrect that in here over the next couple of months in a more optimistic wave in markets. Um, but again, Al of Zero, again, more on the privacy. Uh, in this case, Radix is more focused on the security elements, uh, providing more safety DeFi experience, but there's also energy as well. Now, energy in this case is one of the more smaller cap plays. And again, energy has been a partner on the channel back in the past. I've just known Tommy for a long time. And I think there's actually one important thing here to mention, guys, as I'm always going to be transparent about what you know, projects we've worked, we've worked with in the past. I hope that speaks volume, like that I'm here talking about the projects that they're, they're like projects that I really like that we've had on the channel. So I hope that lets you guys know that I, I really have good intentions. I like these projects, but outside of that as well, Energy has done something that no other EVM compatible ecosystem has done. It has built a hacker proof EVM environment. Right? So if you're thinking about Uniswap, Compound Ave, you know, all those things like automated market makers, lending borrowing protocols, all the kind of established DeFi applications or narratives, NFTs, for example, um, that exist in Ethereum or other EVM compatible ecosystems like Optimism or Arbitrum, Energy is the only network where hacks and exploits cannot fully manifest. Right? So let's say, for example, you have the same smart contract code as a, a new uh, DeFi app that launched Ethereum, and you have it on Energy. On Ethereum, it gets hacked, funds get drained, they get taken forever. In the case of Energy, the moment essentially a smart contract gets drained, right? a hacker is looking to move those funds out ASAP into dollars and get them off an exchange, you know, out of the network, right? Well, the thing is that on Energy, they have a very simple implementation of something known as defense in depth. This is a multi-layer approach to preventing hacks and exploits from manifesting. But essentially, in the event that a smart contract exploit does happen, the thing is that there is a 3,000 block limit on withdrawing energy to various exchange addresses or through the bridge to bring it into the Ethereum version of energy, ERN, ERN, uh, ENRG, I think is the, the token symbol, if I'm not mistaken. But the general point here I want to bring here is that this 3000 block limit allows for a report to be made by users to the Energy Bureau of Investigation, which is the on-chain governance body. And this essentially can allow for those funds to be withdrawn into a new contract address and be withdrawn back out towards the original holders, making the people whole essentially and allowing for the smart contract to be redeveloped and for the project to continue living onward. This is a whole much better ecosystem and setup for new emerging innovative projects. This can allow for essentially, as some of you may recall, Andre Cronier, who has now created Phantom Network and a whole range of other stuff. Back in DeFi summer of 2020, he coined this term deploying in production. The idea that essentially, you could build great ideas um, in production on mainnet and users would use it at their own risk. It's better because users just don't test things on testnet and people are just going to have to assess their own risk. That was a good and bad idea in many ways. It was good in the sense that it did allow for more people to test new novel concepts. Unfortunately, protocols did get exploited using that framework and users lost funds. 
And there's this kind of unfortunate catch-22 in traditional EVM ecosystems where you're like, well, then how are we going to see anything innovative? We need people to adopt these technologies, but they're not going to use it on testnet. If we use it on mainnet, they're going to lose their funds in many cases because it's a new novel concept and there's one line of code in your smart contract and boom, your funds are potentially gone. Well, in the case of energy, it's the perfect testbed for that innovation. It's the perfect place for those new ideas to come to the forefront. And to me, Energy has been one of the only networks really focused on security here. It got brutally hit in the bear market. And the really great thing here is that since then, we've been seeing these huge accumulation waves here with higher lows. So you're seeing a real kind of comeback story here for energy, as I think people are starting to realize that the only way long term that the EVM compatible ecosystem of Solidity Smart Contracts is ever going to win out, the only way we're going to see more innovation is through, in this case, having a secure framework. Right? So we can see energy back in the past has traded much higher valuations here. Even if we take it in market cap terms as there are staking rewards, we can see that right now we're sitting at around a $12 million market cap. This thing has already been about 10x higher from where it was back in the past. I think in a broader altcoin cycle, it can get back up there and maybe even go higher if we start to see more and more ecosystem development in the, in the project itself. So definitely keep an eye on this project as well as Olive Zero and Radix. These are, again, I think some really three good quality projects. And if I didn't mention your project that you feel fits in this category, guys, don't take offense to it. These are just the ones that I'm keeping on my radar that I really think are quite interesting. All right, let's go ahead and talk about Narrative 5 here. Narrative 5 is the topic of sustainable launch pads. Now, I want to go ahead and talk about AngelBlock. The thing about AngelBlock as a project or protocol is that it has solved so much of the fundraising issues in the crypto space that has prevented not only good projects from getting the funding they need, but beyond that as well, from filtering out a lot of the bad actors that essentially leave you and I losing money when we want to invest in early stage projects. There are a lot of launch pads. I can name dozens out there. I don't want to be, you know, kind of political or dramatic here and name names, right? You guys know, if you were back in 2021, there were a ton of launch pads that launched with big promises that they were gonna build the ultimate kind of launch pad ecosystem where people could essentially get access to those early stage tickets or early stage projects so you could get those major multiples that the VCs and the angel investors get in the past. Well, unfortunately, a lot of those protocols are gone. Those launch pads are gone. And now there's a fraction that remain versus what used to stand back in the day. And there's a big reason for that because a lot of those launch pads were just nothing more than launch pads. They're just places where people could invest capital into new ideas. And it wasn't incredibly transparent about the vesting, who was getting what. And there were a lot of uh, cases of corruption where essentially there was a lack of transparency. Things weren't actually fairly distributed. Insiders won and those who obviously put their good faith into the protocol did not win out. AngelBlock is entirely different. AngelBlock is founded by a good friend of mine, Alex, in the crypto space, who I've known again since back 2018, 2019. He is a legacy OG in the crypto space, and him and the team have been focused on building the ultimate launch pad at the end of the day. I think in this case, AngelBlock is even more than a launch pad because it's a sustainable foundation where projects, good quality projects, are going to come to. Because one of the biggest feature sets that it has is the ability to have on-chain governance around raises and more importantly, an implementation of something that I like to call a tranche mechanism. This is something that is not only quite common in the traditional fundraising world, but outside of that as well as something imperative for a space so risky and so prone to rug pulls and empty promises where teams make big white papers, big visions, raise a lot of money, and don't deliver on their promises. Essentially, this kind of vesting schedule or tranche release mechanism allows for the actual investors to vote as to whether or not the project has met certain types of goals and is able to receive certain portions or allocations from the capital that's been set aside for the project. So if, for example, I wanted to launch a project, I wanna raise a million dollars, I don't really need a million dollars right away, right? And outside of that as well, I probably don't deserve a million dollars right away. So you're gonna give me the first 200,000. And then from there, I need to deliver on a few couple key tasks. I need to maybe, for example, deliver an MVP or showcase wireframes or things that showcase, hey, we're actually trying to build something. Then you give me the next 200,000 uh, to go out there and actually deploy a test net or what, what have you, right? So essentially speaking, this is one of the few protocols that I know, it's the only protocol that I know 
in my radar here that I've seen that has this feature built in. And I think it is going to set Angel Block aside from a whole range of other launch pads out there long term. It's going to bring the best quality projects. And outside of this, well, it's going to bring sustainable long term investors, which you want alongside you in the projects you're investing in. All right, guys. So I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit here. There's a last key thing here. I forgot to actually change this. This is narrative seven here. We've got narrative six, which is real world assets. Now, I'm going to run through this relatively quick here, guys. You probably have heard a good amount about real world assets. This is one that's been picking up over the past month or two. The big thing here I want to talk about is some of the key projects that I'm keeping on my radar. Goldfinch is one I've watched for a long time. Uh, Goldfinch is focused on essentially allowing uh, people to utilize stable coins in order to invest in real world lending pools uh, where you can in, uh, invest in emerging economies. You can invest in particular types of pools that are focused on different topics, Latin American sustainability, African innovation, all types of different things. And what's cool is it's real world DeFi and it's essentially allowing for people to tap in their liquidity into real world topics and assets. So I think overall that Goldfinch is probably the best risk reward bet here. It's got a direct listing on Coinbase. It's got good liquidity as well on Uniswap as well. So you guys can access it there. But the key thing that I wanna talk about is that I think Goldfinch has really got that ability to continue expanding from here on out because of the fact of its market cap. It's fully diluted, it's a little high, right around 5 or 50 million. Uh, but again, in the broader altcoin cycle, valuations can really climb out the wazoo. The circulating market cap is really healthy here. Um, and I would just say, as again, you, you kind of get these on pullbacks, right? right? We're essentially turning resistance into support right now. That's a good look here. I like to see that. Uh, but above all, Goldfinch has been around the block for a while. I really like this vision of tapping into real world DeFi. It's something in which we have not really seen in the crypto space and it's a big part of what real world assets could really bring. So as someone who's wanted to see this since 2019, uh, I, I really like this kind of stuff. Um, the next thing I want to talk about as well, another play in the market, which is much larger in market cap, is Ondo, uh, Ondo in this case, or Ondo Foundation. Essentially speaking, Ondo has its key product Flux. Uh, you know, basically they're focused right now on OUSG. This is the first kind of tokenized US treasury in the crypto space. Uh, but the big thing above all, guys, is that this is one of, again, those leading horses. It's next to Centrifuge and a couple other projects out there. Uh, the key thing here is that while I could sit here and tell you guys a lot about the fundamentals and you know why, why I like the project, at the end of the day, Ondo in this case, trend-wise, it's holding up nicely. When it has dips like this, they get bought up quite dramatically, right? We've got a nice flush down here, nearly about 20% from those prior highs. And it's just a matter of this continuing to hold up here. I think that rolled assets as a narrative can continue to play out. I don't like the fully diluted market cap, to be completely candid. I think a lot of this premium that people are, are willing to pay here is betting on the like kind of partial partnership they have with BlackRock, but I don't think that guarantees Ondo to be the, the guaranteed protocol or platform for BlackRock to utilize for tokenization if it decides to break into it. So just keep that in mind. I think there's a little bit of a high-end premium people are paying for this. I lean a lot more towards Goldfinch on a kind of risk-reward adjusted basis. But nonetheless, last narrative here we're going to be talking about to keep on your radar is BRCs or Ordinals infrastructure. Now, I only got one play here that I'll be talking about, which is Multibit or Mubi. Uh, but essentially, Multibit is focused on building the key infrastructure around BRC or Ordinals. Now, Ordinals, obviously, uh, you guys know we've talked about Ordi on the channel. We, we talked about generally this idea that you know ordinals or brcs these new types of tokens on the bitcoin network are obviously a new thing people are excited about them and we're speculating around them uh, and whether or not there are fundamental use cases for brcs or if they really start to take off over the next few years the key thing i want to emphasize here is that multibit is one of the infrastructure plays around that topic and so long as there is a valuation of market cap to brcs there's trading volume and people are trading around them and might want to use them in different fashions i'm interested in the more sustainable and predictable infrastructure plays like multibit that are aiming to actually allow for these brcs which are relatively illiquid and trapped in their kind of closed off environment on the bitcoin network unable to be utilized in different ways other than depositing on exchange and exchanges and essentially speculating on them to be able to bridge them to other networks where they can be more easily utilized or maybe other bitcoin uh, related infrastructure networks uh, and l2s uh, that might come up over the next few years so again 
I don't want to do a huge fundamental deep dive into multi-bit. I just think this is, again, another kind of micro narrative here to keep an eye on. You know, last couple of months here since back in kind of February, this has just been ranging sideways here. I like seeing that it's not declining. I also like seeing that it hasn't just completely rallied out the wazoo because I'd like to capture this next move here, you know, if this starts to play out again. Uh, and at a market cap of 107 million, it's a small cap. It's definitely something that I think, again, has that kind of multiple potential that we laid out here within the chart here. Could easily do one of those like kind of 10, 25x moves. All right, guys, let's move all the narrative sheets here. We talked about a lot of different projects today. Let's really zoom out here. Uh, we had a lot of things we talked about. And I didn't really probably get to cover all of the things that I have on my radar. Uh, but I want to kind of leave you guys off in closing on a few key things. The first big thing above all, as I echoed earlier, all coin cycles are not guaranteed to happen. They are very rare throughout history. And when I say all coin cycles, I'm really talking about these periods of time where you don't have to get it exactly right. Uh, there is a lot of mania in the air. And so long as your position and, and rightfully, you know, decent plays in the market, you are going to make massive gains against Bitcoin, right? So echoing again here, there's no absolute guarantee of that here. So don't you know sit in these positions and just hope and hope and hope. I say that as a friend here, and I say that as someone who has gotten burnt in financial markets before, but above all, has made much more uh, than I would have just simply passive investing in the market because I was able to learn from those mistakes and be able to really nail down some of these narratives early and out of the curve. So keep that in mind. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about though is how you can actually go about approaching uh, building positions here for these different plays, right? So for example, uh, the way I really kind of see it here is that you could start accumulating on positions today. You know, we've had a nice little kind of pullback here in the market. Some believe we're going down to the 100 day moving average. Uh, time will tell here how things play out. If you want to kind of take the risk here and start buying on the dip, you can buy into some of these plays, but there's also another way you can play this. You're gonna pay a little bit more of a premium. You're not gonna get the absolute lows. You're going to have to stick to your convictions and stomach paying a bit of a premium on it. You can also wait until Bitcoin breaks above its prior all time highs, because I can pretty much tell you guys here, unless Bitcoin's really, uh, you know, flushing down here and we start seeing other coins dominance really spiking up. We haven't seen it yet. It's, it looks like it's coiling here and, and kind of getting ready to sometime here in the next quarter. Um, but, you know, until others dominance really starts picking up and Bitcoin is getting back up close to those all time highs. I would kind of advise, you know, I can't give you guys direct financial advice. Personally for me, I'm staying majority in cash for the most part. Uh, I've got some of my positions and bets as we talked about in today's video, um, but you know, keep, keep it cautious. You know, I'm, I'm probably one of the few people who's telling me that. Most people uh, get paid to tell you 100X tomorrow, <laughs> buy this coin. May or may not have a huge bag in it, but 100X tomorrow, go buy this coin, right? I'm not here to do that. I, I'm here to try to do some fundamental research, uh, you know, try to help you guys avoid some of the pitfalls that people commonly fall into, and hopefully you can come out winning big. So in the event of an altcoin cycle, guys, hopefully you're better prepared for today. I only ask two things. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. It is a great way to support the channel. Leave a comment down below if you guys enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts on the projects we talked about, the narratives. And outside of that as well, if you guys want to support the channel, you can always come check out the Dash Report. If you want to know when we're buying into some of these plays, when we're getting in, when we're getting out. Uh, if you have questions you want to ask me as well, you can join the Dash Report discussion group, all these different things. You can get 20% off if you sign up on an analyzed basis for the Dash Report. It's a great way to support the channel and get some extra additional content on top of the free stuff we put out here. But that's going to be it for today's video, guys. I'm Ramon. I'll get them out. It's time for me to go drink some water. It's the longest video I've done in a while. And I'll see you guys on the channel on Monday. Take care, everyone.